All right. So hi, everyone. And uh, I want to welcome you all to the first webinar for this uh, cycle, basically. So in behalf of the National Association of Plant Leaders Graduate Student Working Group, uh, thank you all for uh, for being here. Um, just some uh, housekeeping. Uh, you During the presentation, you can type in your questions in the chat box, and we will be addressing that sometime during the presentation. And also, we will have a uh, question and answer after the uh, presentation. So this uh, webinar is also being recorded, and you can catch it after this if you want to get back and revisit some of the details that you're going to be seeing here. You're going to learn a lot from this webinar. Um, and you can revisit that in the NAPB YouTube channel. So with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. So Dr. Jessica Witkowski is a small grains breeder and quantitative geneticist. She currently leads the winter wheat breeding program at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her mission is to develop varieties that will help improve the profitability of wheat production in the Eastern part of, mid of the Midwest. In line with her goal, Dr. Rutkowski's uh, scholarly research program develops and integrates new ways to improve the efficiency of small grain breeding program, which a lot of it you will see in today's presentation. Before joining the University of Illinois, Dr. Rutkowski worked at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines and at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, or CIMIT, in Mexico. So, Today, Dr. Jessica Witkowski will be talking about reading strategy updates and ideas from the University of Illinois Wheat Reading Program. So Dr. Witkowski. All right, thank you for the opportunity. I'm pretty excited to talk to a group of people that's very interested in plant breeding and uh, you know, it's not every day I get to share and get, you know, I hope we can have some time for um, questions and, and some interaction with you through yeah, um, the chat. I think that's how we're dealing with questions, right? Just the chat box. Okay. All right. So first, um, I just want to emphasize that the work that we're doing, that all of us are involved in, in plant breeding, and especially public plant breeding, it's very important, and it generates a lot of value to society. I think sometimes we forget, we get you know, so we spend too much time in front of our computers or just, you know, preparing seed or whatever. We get so wrapped up in the work that we're doing and just get getting the work done that you forget sometimes how important it is and and that we really have a, such an important role to play. Um, every $1 invested in agricultural research generates $17 in benefits to the U.S. economy. That's uh, huge in uh, return on investment. And a lot of public breeding programs have a huge role to play in variety development itself. In the case of wheat breeding, you know, public breeding programs are generating the majority of US wheat varieties that are that are grown in in this across the nation. And in some crops, there's no other breeding programs other than the public. So we are really in, in doing important work and we should feel motivated by the impact we can have. And then beyond just the national impact that we have, I think we often forget that the work that we're doing actually has a really important role in just food security generally. So we may not think about this every day because you, you know we have enough supply of food on a daily basis. And this is nothing you know, nothing that we really need to worry about. We just assume that we have food, but it's not something we should take for granted. So we know, you know what happened with the Ukraine-Russia crisis, what's still happening really illustrates that we have, there are vulnerabilities and there we really need to make sure that we have a secure national supply of food. And every country needs to have that to make sure that there will not be these barriers to, to feeding the population. So this is showing how that um, Ukraine-Russia crisis caused this huge spike in 
um, grain prices, especially wheat prices. And that, you know, it was just like overnight, suddenly now there's food insecurity. So this is just showing you this, this really important work that we're doing uh, and not to forget that. And then beyond just eating, feeding the, the population, generating value to the economy, we also play an important role in sustaining the environment. We don't usually think that our, you know, a lot of times what we're doing and say improving yield, we don't often think that that's contributing. But if you look at this graph here, this is showing you the global land spared as a re result of cereal yield improvements since 1961. And so this, all that area of the graph in green is showing you that's the land that that would have had to gone under cultivation if we wouldn't have improved yield. So by improving yield, we actually prevented a lot of clearing of, of land for agriculture. And so we you know, are having that impact, although we don't often think of it that way. And every breeding program contributes. You know, we think, you know, what I'm doing is just, I'm just a small, you know, program, or I'm just one person, what could I possibly contribute? But it's all of us together. This is a map showing you all the, not all, but some of the public breeding programs here in the U.S. And all of us as a collective group, as a force, we together address these issues. And so each one of us, although we might feel like insignificant, we're playing a very important role. So just to, you know, help motivate you all and think, okay, all this hard work, where is it going? It's very important that we do it. And we are here at the University of Illinois, one such of these public programs that um, contributes to all these, all these um, missions of, you know, feeding the world, sustaining the environment. And um, here are just some pictures of uh, of some of the members of our group, past and present, uh, we are actually a combination of two research labs that work on small grains and um, and work together on applied wheat and oat breeding, as well as on research to improve the breeding process. And we're very interested in in that mission, you know, releasing varieties um, that farmers can grow and also supporting our fellow breeding breeders in helping you know we helping us accelerate gains in yield and quality and all the other traits of importance and so that's what drives us and uh, I think every member of the group is uh, very motivated to to achieve that and it wouldn't be without you know all these people and more that are not pictured here um I wouldn't be able to present to you today all this work. So kind of a thank you in advance for that. So a little bit about now wheat in Illinois. So I'm going to be talking about the breeding program here and my experience and things that we've been doing to improve the wheat breeding program. But before I get into all those details, I want to give you a little bit of background on wheat here in the state. And we're not solely focused on Illinois. We are, you know, breeding for the region as a whole. Um, but as you know, a breeder here in the state, that is my you know, top priority: is making sure that we serve the needs of stakeholders here in the state. So I will focus on Illinois and um, and and tell you a little bit about it. So here uh, th on this map is um, showing you the concentration of wheat acres in the state. And you can see that it's really focused in the southern part of the state where actually the landscape is a little bit more like Kentucky and Missouri than it is what you might expect of the Midwest. You know, we have these, you know, rolling hills and um, and wooded areas and, you know, it's, it's um, a really different landscape. The soil is also very different the um than the central midwest central illinois and and um kind of the typical corn belt region so 
although a lot there is a lot of acres of corn and soybeans still in southern Illinois there's a lot of wheat as well and wheat is an important crop because it's it's profitable when it's grown in combination with soybean and so the system that uh, wheat is grown in, especially in Southern Illinois, is in the double crop system of soybeans. So the wheat's planted in the fall, and then it gets harvested in end of June or mid-June, and then the soybeans planted immediately after that. And that's actually a, a late planting date for soybean. Normally, soybean would be planted much, much earlier, but people have, through time, figured out that you can still plant soybean at that time in the summer and get pretty good yields. And so the combination of the two crops within a season gives uh, a really good return uh, to the growers, in, especially in relation with other crops. Uh, and it's also a very good way to keep the ground covered. So thinking about uh, cover crops and the benefits of those, wheat is really acting as a cover crop in a sense, although we harvest it for grain. So it's it's covering the ground throughout the winter. Um, and then we're able to also plant another crop. So it's really great system to combine the benefits of um, a lot of the benefits of including a cover crop as well as, you know, producing income. And then the market class that we're growing here in, in the state and also in the Eastern region in general uh, is the soft red winter wheat, which is really um, used in the products like I'm showing you here, cake, uh, pancakes, crackers, pretty much anything that is not a loaf of bread. And I like to think of these items or these, these products as, you know, foods that are culturally significant. So think about all the times that you've had, that you've celebrated, you know, Christmas or your birthday or weddings or, you know, your uh, Sunday brunch or all the times that you typically spend enjoying your life with your family, with your friends, you're probably eating soft wheat in that, in that time. So although you might think, oh, this is just junk food, that's really not true. I mean, this is, these are really um, important for our, you know, our culture and just our day-to-day -day lives. And, and, um, so that's a little bit about wheat in Illinois. And that's, you know, that's what we're breeding for. We're trying to develop varieties that fit well in the double crop system. So they have to be, of course, high yielding, but they also need to be maturing, you know, pretty timely in order to enable the soybean to be planted as soon as possible. The earlier you plant the soybean, the better return you're gonna get on that soybean. So it's really important to consider not only yield, but also the, the maturity timing. And then our major disease problem in the state is scab. So we also focus on scab resistance. And of course, we're always focused on test weight to maintain good test weight to avoid any dockage. So when I got to University of Illinois in 2019, that's when I started, I inherited this, you know, wonderful wheat breeding program that had been operating for many years that so I had a predecessor and then before him was another breeder and I think before him as well. So there was a lot of history, a lot of great germplasm and um, some, you know, very consistent and sustained effort on improving yield and quality and uh, maintaining that, um, you know, that appropriate days to maturity. And this is what the original strategy looked like. There was kind of three components to it that is probably similar to many other breeding programs where you have recombination and line development. So crossing that was taking place in the greenhouse. Everything else was taking place in the field. So we'd grow F1 plants in the field, F2 bulks, then F3 bulks. And then we do our F3 derived head rows, F4 head rows. Then that would go into 
phenotypic evaluation. So then there would be what I was what I call now stage zero. So that's where it goes from a head row into a plot. But that plot was not really a yield evaluation. It was a, you know kind of observational, but you'd also take yield on it, but we wouldn't use we wouldn't do any statistics on the data. So there was sort of this kind of intermediate stage where it was not it was not really based it was somewhat based on data but somewhat visual not randomized and then it would go into stage one two and three which some of you may call you know stage one preliminary stage two and three would be advanced and so this is just just testing you know so this preliminary or stage one would be um not randomized in well, randomized sometimes, but not others, and then in multiple environments and not replicated in some environments. Okay, so then stage two and three would be advanced. So this is just a, you know, uh, RCBD, two reps, randomized in multiple environments. So pretty straightforward in a sense that probably something similar that a lot of other breeding programs are doing. Um, and this had been very well established for a long time. Um, and, and it was working pretty well. But I, when I arrived here to University of Illinois, I had worked already five years in kind of breeding support type of roles. I wasn't the main breeder in my previous positions when I, before I came here, I had five years, I was at Simit and then Erie. And that five year period, I was, you know, I was supposed to be kind of helping or in contributing to breeding programs, modernizing and improving their strategies and implementing new technologies like genomic selection. You know, I was fresh out of my PhD and I wanted to implement all the things I learned. And I think after those five years of time, I was very frustrated that I couldn't implement anything that I want, you know, that the way I wanted to do it. And so when I got to Illinois, I was so ready to just change and implement what I think needed to be done. And so that's really what motivated me to change the breeding strategy. And, um, and also during that whole time we had a lot of of course i started in 2019 we had covid there was a lot of um we had the great resignation we had a lot of people quitting their jobs there was just a lot of changes happening in the world and so i had a big um change in staff people left i had to hire new people and so there was just this natural opportunity to start in a way have a fresh start and really implement things the way I wanted to do it. So, so that's, this is the breeding strategy that I came up with. And of course, we still have the three components, recombination, line development, phenotypic evaluation, and pure seed production. But we're doing things in a faster way and using data, uh, especially genome-wide marker data. So we're using genomic selection. We're also doing the testing a little bit differently. So I'll walk you through a little bit um, and spend a little bit of time on this because you know, since this audience here consists a lot of plant breeders that are probably interested in the strategy, whereas a lot oftentimes when I present this, I don't get into detail because I know, you know, maybe not that many people are interested. So I'll walk you through it a little bit. Um, we do crossing, uh, grow the F1 plants and the F2 bulks in the greenhouse. So shortening the cycle. Also, I I make sure that never never leaving any seed on the shelf. So as soon as we get data from harvest, I'm deciding what crosses to make and we plant the crossing block. So we're really trying to get things as fast as possible to shorten the breeding cycle. We all know how important that is for genetic gain. Okay, so we do F1 plants, F2 bulks in the greenhouse. And then we get the F3 seeds and plant the F3 plants in the field. So then those F3 plants actually, we're planting them as 
individual plants. Now, in the past, we would have done it as a bulk. We pick single spikes and then put that in a head row. Now, what we're doing is we're planting the single plants, getting a lot of seed from one plant because it's, it has plenty of space. It produces a lot of seed. And then using that seed to increase. So we put that then to a plot, which is basically a normal sized yield plot and increasing seed. And we're able to generate about four or five pounds of seed the next year, just going from the single plant. So we go single plant to, you know, let's say 20 grams of seed, plant those 20 grams of seed and get about five pounds. So that's pretty, pretty quick seed increase. And then we can get that seed and put it straight to multi-environment testing. So instead of having a phase where we're having like sort of an observational, like instead of having head rows where then we do a visual selection and then the next year we do an increase in a visual selection, we're going straight from, we're kind of skipping a step. We're going straight to the, um, you know, it, instead of a head row, we're, we just go straight to a big plot. And then the big plot goes straight to testing. So it's kind of skipping a step. Um, and then we genotype all of those that, um, you know, we harvest all these for a seed increase, and then we genotype all those as well. And we use that to uh, help us make decisions on what to advance. And also at that point in time, although we haven't done this yet, but this is something um, we aim to do is actually select parents at that point in time. So even before testing, so we'll have, we have the seed of these, you know, of these F3 drive to fours, we genotype them and then use that to decide what to do with them as well, crossing as well as advancing. Okay, so that's, um, that's kind of the, I would say that's probably the biggest change that we've made is on this part of the, the pipeline because it's really different uh, to the previous what was done. And then the phenotypic evaluation, although we've also made a lot of changes there, um, we still have multiple stages of testing, but we're oops, going suddenly backwards here. So we still have multiple stages of testing, but as you'll see, and I'll explain in more detail, um, a little bit later in the presentation, the way that we're doing that is uh, a bit different. Okay, so now um, I'll get into a little bit more detail about each of these steps and kind of how we do uh, different things. So first of all, when we're selecting parents, so the selection is based on total net merit. So net merit it's actually a concept that has been around for a long time. So this is total profitability. And it, in, it incorporates the traits that have economic value. So for us, that's yield, the maturity date, the level of deoxynovalanol in the grain, which is produced by scab, and test weight. So all these factors have an effect on the profit that a farmer would would make if they had grown that particular line or variety. So of course, yield is an obvious one, you know, yield times price is typically that's profit in the simplest sense in the simplest scenario. But we also, we also have to consider the soybean prof, you know, soybean yield of the, because we're in a double crop system. So the, the maturity date affects how much will profit off the soybean because it affects the soybean yield. So that is also um, in the formula. And then the price of wheat not only depends on the market price, but also what uh, it has to include the discounting that would occur based on the level of DON, deoxynovalanol, and the test weight. So all these factors put that into a formula to, to tell us net merit. And I can, for every individual a line, I can calculate its net merit. And for every every cross combination, I can calculate net merit. So I can get expected progeny, you know, get the two parents and then determine the expected values of their progeny for every trait and estimate the net merit for every 
cross combination as well. And so then when we're making crosses, I'm actually using the rankings of the net merit of each cross to decide what cross to make. And we have this nice tool that we use to help us make the best crosses in the greenhouse. So this is nice. So I have my cross rankings. So every cross combination out of my, my selected parents has a ranking. And then we go in the greenhouse and take, what we do is just look at what's, what can we cross that day? What plants can be, what lines can be females? What can be males? And sort of take inventory of what's, what's available to be crossed. And then um, I have a, a, a nice algorithm that will tell me what, what crosses to make. I just input that information. I have the ranking information in there loaded in, and then I get a ranking. I get a, I get the list of crosses that we need to make and the rank. So that's been really nice. And, and it's a, takes a lot of the um, sub subjectivity and the manual keeping tabs on what's what to cross. So it, um, it's been really nice to use. Then after we make the crosses, and then we, we grow the F1 plants, the seed of the F1 plants goes into um, like our the speed breeding process. So we're uh, using the, the protocol that um, Eric Olson developed at Michigan State University to advance these um, populations in the greenhouse. And then, you know, we put them into vernalization, transplant them, then we have the, the bulks ready to harvest, and then we get our F3 bulk seeds. Okay, then, okay, so we take those F3 bulk seeds and now um, we have two pipelines that we can put them in. And I've been doing, so I started off just, you know, I couldn't, it was like in the beginning, I couldn't decide should I still have hedgerows or should I go completely to single plants? And I've settled on, at least for now, I've settled on having two pipelines where we have um, kind of a more of a conventional one where we have hedgerows and F3 bulks and then a less conventional one where we have single plants and go directly to increase. So we take that F3 bulk seed, we're getting, we get that around October, like right around now. And then we can plant those single plants in the field, then get the next season our small increase plots, or we can send the F3 bulks to a winter nursery well, where we are very sure we're going to get, we're not going to get any problems with winter kill or you know due to late planting or anything like that. And then we take our, um, get single spikes back, put that in head rows and, and then increase seed um, after that. So we're doing both of this and then everything that that is in the small increase plots is getting genotyped and we're as soon as we get marker data on those we can base our selection decisions on genomic predictions okay so i don't want to get into obviously all the details on this slide but i wanted to put this up there because um the devil and that is always in the details like how are you going to actually do this and what are the numbers and then not only you know it's not only that you can just develop these f3 derived lines and then you know test them but you also have to have pure seed of these as well so here i'm showing you okay there's actually more steps involved that at the same time that we're increasing the seed from, so for in this case, from the single plant nursery pipeline, we're increasing the seed. We also have to purify because these are F3 derived. So we have to purify a couple of times and get a large increase so that by the time we are finished testing, we have a hundred pounds of seed of, um, of something that is F5 derived that we can give to uh, you know a seed company or in or release as a variety. So there's 
you know, there's a lot of um, figuring out that we constantly have to do to make sure that, you know, obviously the numbers are manageable and that we also produce pure seed of the lines that we're testing. Okay, so before I move on to the yield evaluation part, um, I just wanted to see if there's any um, burning questions that maybe we can take one or two at this time to make sure that I leave enough time. Are there any questions from the Q&A that I should take? Yeah, it looks like we got one. Okay. Uh, how long does the first part of the pipeline take for your wheat program from crossing to your first field evaluation? From crossing to the first evaluation is three years, I believe. Yes. So I maybe go back and double check here if I can. Okay, so... All right, so this, this happens, and then this is like the first year, the second year. So let's see, probably it's more like four years. So this is one, two, three, yeah. So it's four years. It's three years to get them into the field and four years to get them into testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like we got quite a few coming in now. Um... You mentioned that you do single plant, you plant single plants. What equipment are you using to, to do that? Yeah, so for the first two years, we actually um, had, we actually transplanted. So we used a, like a paper plot transplanting system and it was mostly, it was pretty manual, although it looks a lot, less manual in the in the you know advertisement <laughs> of the equipment so uh we tried that and it does work it's just a lot of it's a lot it's very manual this let just this last week we tried um using our typical uh, head row planter but just avoiding the cone and going in and doing it that way so that's what we've done um and we don't have the results of that quite yet yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know yeah, some, I think I I know some other breeders out east who are doing that, so. Yes, yes. And so, yeah. <laughs> Just messing with the settings on their head row planer <laughs> enough to where it's, yeah. It yeah, works. yeah. And, and we, <laughs> yeah, and I've kind of been asking, okay, does this work? <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, so it, let's hope. Um. Okay, I think I might continue for now, but cool. that's great that we have some questions. I want to make sure we have time. Yep. But we'll have plenty at the end. Okay, so. great. Okay. So yeah, thanks mm -hmm. uh, for those questions. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot to to explain on on the line development. But then of course, now the most of our resources probably go into yield evaluation, you know, all, even though line development is also resource intensive, I'd say yield, yield evaluation is more so. So just a little overview, we have five main locations within Illinois for our breeding program, and then um, about eight out of state locations. And that's all through collaborations with other breeding programs. The testing design that actually, this is uh, updated for 2024, is sparse testing. And we have what, you know, what that looks like here, what I'm trying to show you with this figure is that we've got lines that are um, not in every environment, but they're in some environments, but not others. And most of the time, most lines in the field, most plots, they're unreplicated. So there is within a location, we have 20% replications, 20% of the lines are replicated and 80% are not. And we try to distribute so that lines have roughly the same number of environments and observations 
um, when you add them all up across all the locations. And then lines that are in fewer environments and fewer reps are the ones that are in earlier stages of testing. So our stage one, which would be the largest, is would be um, a lot of these lines here. And then we have actually stage one and two is is in the mix here. And then stage three are some are lines here and stage four um, are in almost all environments. And that helps to have connectivity across all the environments so that when we go to analyze the data, we can easily separate the genetic and the non-genetic effects. Okay, so part of what has allowed us to be able to do all this testing is we have um, what we call environment swapping. We're changing, exchanging trials for testing. So I'll test a trial for say Virginia and Virginia tests a trial for me. We're not pulling our germplasm together. We're just exchanging packets of seed and planting it for and harvesting for each other. Um, that's one way that I think is very, very nice. There's also cooperative trials, which we have. We pull the germplasm together from multiple breeding programs, evaluate in each other's environments. That's uh, also very good, but a lot more coordination involved in that um, to, you know, with coordinating all the exchange of germplasm. Then another interesting thing we're doing, we have, of course, partial replication. So this is in one environment, what that looks like for an example, where here are the plots and how they're laid out in the field. The replicated entries are shown in green and the, un, the um, sorry, replicated are shown in yellow and the unreplicated are shown in green. So we can see the replicated entries are distributed across the field and they're across, um, we still have blocks like we have here. I'm showing you, we have replication one and replication two. And our, so our replicated entries are observed once in rep one and once in rep two. Okay, so this is just a partial replicated design. And then we also have complete randomization. So we're taking all our breeding stages and randomizing them all together in the same field. And that is very helpful in the, of course, in the PREP design because you need 20% replication. So naturally, your later stage breeding material become the replicated entries. Now we've also found that by doing this, we increase selection accuracy. And we've done some simulations to show that that is the case. And I'm not gonna get into details there, but uh, th there's really, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose by doing this. Okay, so now I am going to skip the part on scab because I don't wanna take all the time, I want to have some time for questions. Um, but just to mention the highlights of that, in the case of our scab evaluation, we have streamlined it so that we're really only collecting data on the traits that we absolutely need to collect. So that because we're using genomic prediction, we found that we can actually reduce the number of different traits that we're phenotyping and without really losing any accuracy. So that's something that has been really helpful in reducing the workload in the scab nursery. And then we're working on how do we make our yield evaluation even, even better and our genomic prediction models even better. And by one of the ideas uh, that we're exploring is this concept of phenomics assisted genomic selection for yield. So we've all probably heard about using drones to predict yield, and then we've all heard about genomic selection. And then there's kind of um, a lot of interest in comparing or saying, you know, oh, I think phenomic selection's better. I think genomic selection's better. But I feel like, you know, my view is that we're probably gonna end up using both but in some way. Like there is gonna be advantages or times when one, one type of prediction is useful and times when another is useful. And so I don't really see it as a competition or like one is better than the other. And 
one of the ways I feel like we could combine these is by say you have a, a location and you let's say you plant a thousand blocks at that location. Now imagine doubling that. Say, okay, instead of planting a thousand plots, I'm gonna plant 2000 plots, but I'm only gonna harvest the same amount. I'm gonna harvest, I'm gonna you know, keep my workload similar. The only workload that increases is planting and collecting HTP data. So you would plant, you know, basically increase the size of your testing footprint and then harvest the same amount, collect data on um, all these vegetation indices using UAVs. And so here, this picture, this um, part of the figure here, this number one, uh, where it says HTP data, that's showing how we're collecting HTP data on what we're calling the core plus the accessory training sets. Okay, so that means we're collecting HTTP data on everything in the field. Then we have grain yield data collected only on the core training set. So that means we're collecting, there's a core set, which is our 1000 plots. So we're only gonna collect yield data on that group. Okay, but we have maybe 2000 plots where we collect everything. Okay, so then, we have a bunch of plots that we didn't harvest. And what we'll what we're going to try to do is impute yield on those plots that we did not harvest in that field using all the data from that field. Okay, so use all the data we yield data plus vegetation indices and we generate a predicted yield for those plots that we did not harvest. And we believe that we can get pretty accurate predictions on on those for those unharvested plots. And then, so that's what we're calling the unharvested plots, those lines that we're imputing, we're calling that the accessory training set. So that's like an additional set that we would not have been able to evaluate otherwise. And then that is contributing to our genomic selection model. So we are able to, um, what we're going to try to do is use those imputed yield values to help us improve this, increase the size of our training set. We're going to use those grain yield values as if they were real data. So yeah, we're right in the in the midst of this project, and in fact, I'm I'm still um, interviewing postdocs to uh, work on aspects of this project. So if any of you know someone or are interested, you can contact me or fill out an application. Um, and yeah, I hope in the future to show some more interesting results on how this is going. So that brings me to the end of the talk and just to reflect on the experiences um, here from the past four years. Um, number one, changing anything or any change in life, really, then that applies to breeding and other other aspects, is it's always going to be more work. You know, it's always more work at first. And that's something you have to accept. Um, and you have to be prepared for that. Also, you know, technology is wonderful, but it's not going to make your life easier. It's actually, you're going to still have a a lot of work to do. It's still, it just makes it possible to do more with the resources that you have. So you should, you know, I feel like this is me, my, my opinion here, but you should never think of it, you know, technology as, oh, this is going to make my life easier. Or this is going to make, uh, you know, oh, our breeding is going to get breeding programs. Breeders are going to have easier jobs. That's not true. It's just going to make you able to do more with the current resources you have. And the last thing, you know, I think this is a, I guess a big word of wisdom or, or something. Um, I think you should choose a career in plant breeding because you love it. You know, there's, it's, it's not, you know, a very easy job. It's a fun job. It's a rewarding job if you love it. But if it's not, you know, if you don't feel like it's something that you really love, um, it's, it's going to be really hard. It's a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of, um, you know, difficult timelines, deadlines, 
Um, it's, it's not, not a predictable schedule. So you really have to love it in order to get you through all the challenges and to feel that, that rewarding feeling at the end of the day. So that's my kind of word of advice. Uh, there's a, you know, there's so many opportunities out there. And so if you're really, if you're into plant breeding, um, make sure that you're really in love with it because it will be, if not, it will be hard, hard, feel like hard work to you. Okay, with that, um, would like to acknowledge all of the people involved in our research group and collaborators and all the sources of funding that have helped contribute to this work. And here's just a group picture. I, uh, all, all the um, changes, like as I said, change is more work. And so a lot of the um, changes that I've been able to make in the breeding program wouldn't be possible without all the students and staff and um, our previous postdoc pictured here um, that really contributed and really worked hard to figure these things out. And, and uh, it's been a great team effort. Okay, so I hope I left time for questions now. Um, should we start the questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have 15 minutes actually, or even more for questions. Mm -hmm. So we have mm -hmm. a lot from the Q and A, so Andy. Yeah, let's see what we got. Um, so one one question is, um, I think this is a lot of things breeders have to face is, are you trying to breed varieties that are stable across environments or are you targeting for specific environments? Yeah, so I actually haven't found like very clear mega environments in our testing network that we've been so far, you know, for the past couple of years that we've been testing. It's really seems to be there's no real clear pattern. Like there's, hey, you know, there's almost, I, I feel like there's a distribution of environments and some of them, and it obviously varies from year to year. It's not like, you know, there's, there isn't even consistency among locations oftentimes. So there's just a distribution of environments. And then some of those environments appear to be average, like they correlate with a lot of other environments. And some of those environments don't really correlate with anything. Um, they're very sort of independent. No, there isn't anything that's negatively correlated. So everything, that all these data yield in all these environments, it's all positively correlated. Um, and it appears to me, there really isn't a whole lot of delineation by mega environments for yield. So I'm not really selecting for some specific subregion adaptation. I use all the data to try to tell me what will be performing well across all these possible environments because year to year variation is huge. And so, you know, I, by, by testing across larger area, I'm hoping that I can identify these lines that are, that will have good yield across years as well as across the whole region. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, there's a lot of questions in here about your um, crossing tool and what parameters and variables you're you're incorporating into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really, as I said, based on net merit. So um, that's, you know, as far as um, traits go, that's incorporating yield, test weight, um, days to maturity, and scab resistance in the form of, you know, deoxynevalanol levels. Now, in addition to that, you know, as I've done it now a few seasons, I've I've made some modifications. So if there are combinations where both parents are tall, I don't make the cross. I eliminate those because I, you know, the progeny are not likely to be short. <laughs> and and so I do that. Um, I also constrain the number of times 
that a line can contribute to a cross. So I kind of, I say for every line, I'm going to, I'm going to um, include the top, let's say six com combinations for that line. And then I generate the ranking. I re I regenerate the rankings based on that so that I try to make it so that not, there isn't just like one single pedigree just popping up again and again, or like one line that's just in every single cross. Like that tends to happen. You know, you tend to have like one line, you know, all the ranking, best ranking crosses are made with one line. And so I'm like, I don't want to generate a NAM population every year. You know, I want to have, I don't want to have put all my eggs in one basket. And, um, and so, but it's hard because oftentimes no matter what you do to try, try to tweak the rankings, it sort of tends to happen. Right. Um, uh, there's some questions and I personally have a question as well about uh, the way you're utilizing high throughput data. Um, you mentioned trying to uh, impute on on harvested or on uh, trials where you're not collecting yield data. Um, is that normally when within a year within an environment or are you trying to impute and predict for untested environments as well? So, so far, the plan is to focus within environment, and I don't feel that confident we're going to be able to predict across, but I might be, yeah. who knows, I might be surprised, but haven't tried it. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you, I have had very limited success. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Uh, da -da. Trying to see if there's any other good questions here. Um, a question from registration that I thought was really good. Um, from your time at Erie and Simit, um, international mm -hmm. large breeding breeding programs, institutions, are there things that were done at those institutions that you think could be incorporated into? smaller public breeding programs in the Midwest that aren't being done currently? Oh, good question. Um, you know, I always kind of felt that there was a lot of the other way around. You know, there's a lot of, because a lot of what is done at the international centers in the applied breeding programs, you know, not talking about the research and, and, and the other things happening. Um, they're, uh, they're similar to a lot of what, what a lot of plant breeding programs are currently do or, or currently doing, or were doing years ago, but just on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to think of examples, um, right now. Yeah, I guess like the the main thing that I felt was really impressive about, especially Simit, was just you know their ability to to generate extremely high quality yield data. That was really something I thought, man, we I, we need to figure out how to do this, you know, because it's something about you know obviously the uniformity of the site, but um, just the ability to get you know reliabilities for a yield like in the 0.9 you know within a trial on a routine basis so that was something like you know aspirational that I you know I think we're getting there but it's um I, I yeah and I don't know what's the secret sauce <laughs> over there that <laughs> we can replicate yeah yeah cool um Are there emerging technologies, things coming out that you're excited to explore in the next five to 10 years? So you mentioned drone drones and high throughput phenotyping. Is there anything else kind of like that that you, you see in the coming down, maybe not yet that's ready to implement, but has potential? Yeah, um, you know, to be honest, I haven't really seen anything that exciting, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, what we're 
doing and like new ideas are, you know, say in the area of AI and, and things like that. I think we're still like a ways away from that being useful. I think that's, I hope that it will be useful, but I, I'm a, you know, I'm not super hopeful that in the short term, we're going to see useful tools coming out of that. Um, actually, what really excites me is a lot of the automation that we're seeing in just breeding operations. So just, you know, I just had a, got an email from like Winter Steiger, you know, seeing like their new robotic kind of like seed prep, you know, so a lot of that sort of thing that really, I feel like that's very underappreciated, but that has a huge impact on the scale and the ability to, to do things efficiently with uh, costs increasing, um, you know, with, with labor and materials and everything else. Yep. Um, John, you see any other good questions? You have anything? All right. So, I mean, we have a lot of questions coming in, but in the interest of time, I apologize that, you know, we have to cut this. I know you guys are very interested with our webinar, as I can see there, again, there's a lot of questions, but <laughs> if, this is a, if this is a two hour <laughs> webinar, we can, uh, <laughs> yeah. we can address all of these, but again, <laughs> it's really nice that you guys are very interested, have learned a lot in this talk. I'm pretty sure of that. If you want, again, we will be uploading this webinar on YouTube. So if you want to revisit this talk and rewatch it, feel, please feel free to do that. Um, I just wanted to plug our next webinar while we're at it. So especially for, uh, for international students out here. So our webinar in November will primarily talk about, you know, immigration challenges and potential uh, opportunities for uh, international students. So I think that would be something very interesting for you to look out for. So we will be posting details of that uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it, so watch out for that in our Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Facebook pages. Again, we want to thank Dr. Jessica Rutkowski so much for your time. Thank you. Um, and for your presentation. Again, I personally have learned a lot. Um, and yeah, and uh, I hope we could see you again in our next webinar. Thank you and uh, have a good day. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.